Well, good morning. Good morning and welcome everyone to Blessings Christian Church. So glad to see you here as people are coming in. Uh, my name is Pastor Greg. It's a blessing to welcome also those who are joining us uh, online via the live stream. Glad that you're doing that and you can get to know us that way as well. A special welcome this morning if you are here as a, a guest, a visitor, a first or second time attender. We're glad that you are here among us as well. You may have questions about Blessings Church. You can email them in to uh, info at blessingshamilton.ca. We'll respond to you. You can ask any of the ushers at the back of the church with the blue lanyards on, answer any of your questions about what's happening at Blessings today, what's happening throughout the week. And there's also uh, welcome cards in the back of many of the chairs and pews. You can fill that out, hand it in to myself or one of the ushers, and uh, we'll be sure to answer you uh, in this week ahead. Um, there's a time for prayer also before this, after the service this morning and after the service tonight by the Purple Prayer Banner. Please do make use of that as you wish to. People can pray with you, for you, a need on your heart, something to bring to the Lord our God, rejoicing. We'd love to do that with you just by this banner uh, after the service. You can also email prayer-team at blessingshamilton.ca and submit your prayer requests there. Uh, following the service today, there is a lunch downstairs. All are welcome to come and join some, join for a simple lunch around some tables, uh, get to know each other a little bit more. Uh, all are welcome to that just through any of the doors below. Uh, and there's also a yak, special yak lunch today after church in the far room in the basement. That's for 18 plus, and that group will be uh, starting their study of one of the books by Tim Keller, as well as enjoying lunch together. You can get onto that WhatsApp group if you show up there after the service. You may find, like we announced last Sunday, just last announcement, that uh, there's a photographer walking around the sanctuary this morning. If you see them, don't ask them to leave. Uh, they're supposed to be here. And uh, this has been arranged as part of our website update. You may see them taking photos throughout the morning. If you don't want to be visible in any of the photographs, please speak to an elder, a pastor, or an usher, and we'll make sure that that happens. I've been asked also to say that after the service, there's lunch, there's yak, but there's also, we'd love everyone to please, if they could, leave through the front doors of the church so we can have our photographer uh, active and getting a lot of no action shots. You don't have to sort of look particularly happy or whatever it may be. But you can leave through the front doors if you could, just to give the photographer a chance to uh, have lots of material to, to work with. So thank you for that. I invite you as you're able to uh, rise for our call to worship. And this is from Psalm 47. Clap your hands, all people. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sounds of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises.
Well, part of worship at Blessings every Sunday morning is to include in the service a time of prayer of confession of our sins before God. Uh, let us lift up our hearts. Let's then bow down before the Lord, our Maker. Well, Father, how good it is to sing praises to you, to lift our voices in song. At the beginning of a new week, Lord, to join in praise uh, with your people. How we thank you, O oh God, for your faithfulness, for your mercy, for your love, for your goodness. How uplifting it is, Lord, to sing praises together to you. For you are worthy and deserve all of our praise. We wish to point our lives towards you and give you glory for who you are and for everything that you've done for us in Christ, for all that you've given us. How we thank you, gracious God. And Lord, as we come before you, who is holy and perfect, we remember that you are the God of truth and of justice. We read in the Psalms, Lord, rebuke us not in your anger. And so we come confessing, Lord, that we are in need of your mercy. We come into your presence confessing that we conceal many things from you or try to, and we hide things from others. Lord, we confess that by sinning, we bring heartbreak and sorrow to other people around us, that even in our wrongdoing, we make it difficult for others to forgive us. And Lord, we ask for your forgiveness for the times that that we've not forgiven others either, where we've rested in our sin and looked to that more than we've looked to you. And Lord, in this moment of quiet, we simply would come before you who is gracious and good and true and unload the burdens of our hearts. For we know that if we hide our sin and do not confess it, it remains there as a weight. And in this moment, hear us as we confess our our sin to you, Lord. Gracious God, how we thank you for your word which teaches us and proclaims to us here is a trustworthy saying full of acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. And so, Lord, we rejoice in the forgiveness that you offer in Jesus, the new start, the new beginning, that indeed your grace and goodness have the last and final word. Be pleased with our worship this morning. We're grateful to be in your presence. And we commit this morning to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as uh, kids go to Calvary Club and Little Kids Club, we're going to respond uh, with words from Psalm 84.
Today's reading comes from Micah chapter 7, verse 18 to 20. Who is a God like you? Who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will dread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. You will be faithful to Jacob and show love to Abraham as you pledged on an oath to our ancestors in days long ago. This is the word of the Lord. Well, our New Testament reading is from Romans chapter 5, and I invite you to uh, turn there if you have a Bible with you or on your phone uh, or on the screens behind me. Uh, Romans chapter 5, starting at verse number 18, all the way to the end. Uh, Paul says these words, consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men. So also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. The law was added so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more, so that Just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Well, let's pray. Gracious God, it has been good to have been walking through your word here in Romans chapter 5 for the last several weeks, and we arrive with some joy at the end of this chapter. We thank you that it is indeed the word of God, your word, O living God. And for some of us, it's been a busy week and lots of different thoughts and things on our minds. And I pray, Lord, that you would silence now in us any voice except your own and that we may know the Lord Jesus speaking the word of God to our hearts. And we ask this in his name. Amen. Well, when our kids were younger, we read to them a series of books called The Brief History Of. And in that brief, brief History Of series, there was a book called The Brief History of Shakespeare. Uh, there was a book called The Brief History of Galileo. There was a book called The Brief History of Newton. There was a book called, I think, I could be making this up now, I couldn't find the series. It's in a box somewhere. The Brief History of Space was in there. A Brief History of all kinds of things were in this series. And they were kind of thin little books, and they would outline in broad strokes the brief history of a person's life, say Shakespeare, or say of a thing, say space and the planets out there around us. And what we've noticed in Romans chapter 5, in fact, last week, which was pretty heavy lifting, last week was kind of like spiritual aerobics, maybe, I don't know. It was kind of like theological weightlifting last last week as we looked at the middle of Romans chapter 5. What we noticed last week is that indeed the Apostle Paul is sketching out for us here in broad strokes, remember I used the example of us painting our garage door, a broad stroke of blue here, another broad stroke over here. He's laying out for us in broad strokes a religious history of the world. Here we have in the end of Romans chapter 5, a brief religious history of the world. Why it is that the world is the way it is. Why it is that we as human beings find ourselves in the condition that we're in. And he is talking about deep, kind of heavy, significant, serious things, wonderful things. And they are in the context of our series, or our series here is in the context of them, abundant life in Christ, abundant life in Christ. And we come this morning to the end of chapter 5. Pastor Bill will be picking up chapter 6. I hope it's a lot harder than chapter 5 later in just a few uh, weeks. But as we look at the end of chapter 5, I'd like us to consider God's word to us this morning in two 
uh, kind of overarching labels and phrases. The first is, we'll find in, in these words, two definitive eons to be understood, and we'll find one final word to be heard. Two definitive eons to be understood, and one final word to be heard. Well, we come to the very first one in verse 18, two definitive eons to be understood. And we see here Paul uses that word consequently. And we'll see three of these in a minute, their institution, their impact, and their disconnection. That is the two definitive eons. But Apostle Paul doesn't start there. He starts with the word consequently in verse uh, 18 and verse 1. What is he talking about here? Just as a reminder, he is talking about a verse that he talked about earlier, verse 12 in your Bibles. You'll see, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and this way death came to all men because all sin. That's the beginning of that paragraph in verse 12. There's a big hyphen after verse 12 where Paul then, last week we talked about kind of the, um, the, the, the clarification he gives of that principle. Here in verse 18, the consequently is kind of a continuation now. He's finishing his main thought from verse 12, and he's really bringing this whole idea home, that there are two definitive eons in the history of the world and eternity that we need to understand. Consequently, he says, and so we look at the first point of these two definitive eons, their institution, he's, he's building on this, and he says in the previous verses that there are two eons that have been instituted in the world. The very first one in, Romans, in, in verse 12, it, earlier as I said, is that sin has entered the world, and because of sin, universal death. And then he goes on in the rest of the verses saying that this, this came through uh, the man Adam, that was instituted through the man Adam, the universal reign of death and why we have sin in the world. And then the rest of the verses he goes on from last week saying the other uh, great eon is the eon of Jesus Christ. That, that all of us live in, uh, that, that, that there's this great eon that Christ himself has ordained and brought into being of, in the world. There are not one, not three, but two great eons that we need to understand as existing in the world as God has governed it, set it up, and oversees it. And we see about these two eons, their institution through Adam and through Christ. We see, secondly, their impact. And what do we read about their impact in these verses? Well, we read quite clearly about their, their, their impact, their uh, their impact is here, consequently, it says, just as the result of one trespass, there's the institution of that first eon, the trespass of Adam. What is the impact of that first trespass of Adam? Condemnation for all men. And then he goes on in the second verse, verse 19, uh, just as through the disobedience of one man. What's the institution of this eon? It's through the disobedience of Adam. And he gives the impact. Many were made sinners uh, through Adam's disobedience. That's the impact of, of, of sin coming in the world through Adam. And Paul makes this distinction, being made sinners, this idea that um, we ourselves, it's deeper than me or you simply waking up one morning and choosing to sin, and therefore our lives leading to death because of that sin that we have chosen. It's more than that, says Adam, the impact of these two eons. In fact, we are born into Adam's a race, that we sin in and with Adam, that we uh, are, are born sinful in that sense, that, that there is this idea of original sin that each person in the world is born into. That's a very hard concept for us to grasp, or maybe not to grasp, but to accept. That, that by nature of being born into this world and because of Adam's sin and disobedience, that the impact of that for me is that when I come into this world, death is before me because of sin entering the world through him. And if you're a new to Christianity or maybe you're just here this morning thinking about um, 
you know, church and Christ and you maybe whatever the God has brought you here for some reason. We're so glad that you're here to have this conversation with us this morning. It's a very fundamental kind of understanding of humanity. That, that we are born into Adam's eon, into Adam's race. In fact, many people have, have, have taken an affront to this idea, the impact of Adam's uh, work and disobedience. Uh, Blaise Pascal, the famous French philosopher and theologian and mathematician, writes about this at length. And he finally ends by saying, well, without it, that is, without original sin, uh, what can we say that man is? And we see the, the impact of Adam explains for us the condition we're in where, whereby we are born and as we grow we see death coming physically to us. And the impact that we experience about living in our daily lives trying to follow God's way of goodness and rightness. We want to be kind to each other and, and loving to each other. We want to follow whatever is pure and good is true. And when we don't follow these things we feel guilty because we've done something wrong. Uh, that impact is, is because of Adam's disobedience, trespass, and sin. We are made sinners because of Adam's disobedience we see in verse 19. It is a reality without which understanding or accepting we will continue to strive in our lives for meaning, for understanding, and for hope out of the condition that we're in. We see also the impact not only of Christ, of Adam's sin, but we see the impact here in these verses as Paul summarizes his huge spiritual weightlifting argument in this chapter, end of this chapter. We see the impact of Christ. Whereas Adam trespassed in verse 18, it says Christ had an act of righteousness. Whereas Adam in verse 19 had a disobeyed, uh, Christ himself obeyed. Uh, and in his obedience, many will be made righteous. And in verse 18, we're, we're justified. And so we see this opposite impact of Christ's obedience and his act of righteousness that those who surrender their lives to him are justified before God, declared innocent before God. The sins are, are wiped away, and the impact of those sins are wiped away. And it says that is a continuing work and invitation that God uh, gives to all people in the world will be made righteous. It is something that is going on even now. The work of Christ, the obedience of Christ is, is able to be, others in the world can benefit from this through future generations of, of mankind. And so these are, these are big thoughts. These are huge thoughts. The eon of Adam and the eon of Christ, the eon of trespass and disobedience and death and condemnation, which explains the angst we feel as human beings from in every place in the world. And the eon of Christ, the one that comes through his, his act of righteousness, which leads to justification through his obedience and how we will be made righteous. Those who look to him and surrender to him are made righteous and right before God. The weight of our sins are lifted. We hear you are forgiven in our hearts and in our lives. Now, Paul wants us to understand that there is a thirdly, a big disconnect between these two eons, that there are some similarities to them um, in that it's through one man that the world is affected in each one. But there is a disconnection that is, there's even a chasm between the two eons. There's a, there's, there's a huge space between the eon of Christ and the eon of Adam. They're not the same. In fact, uh, it's the biggest difference in, in the whole world. It's the biggest spiritual difference in the whole world, whether we find ourselves in the humanity of Adam or in the humanity of Christ. This is a a moment, we believe as Christians, that when we surrender our lives to Christ and look to him as Savior, this is an irreversible thing that happens in our own lives. We find ourselves living and present in Adam's age or living and present in the age of Christ. 
that we are taken from death to life, that Christ's saving work cancels out Adam's domination of sin, and we are made righteous. Which eon are you living in? Maybe, uh, maybe you're a, a, a teenager here this morning, and uh, you've, you know, seen faith in your parents, grown up in the church. Um, what do you think of all this? What eon do you think you stand in? What eon do you want to stand in? What does it mean for us to have abundant life in Christ? How do we respond to this, the, 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 this great spiritual reality that the Lord God sets before us? Well, the Apostle Paul, in his way, a very logical guy, a very, of course, heavy theological chapter, he makes a, a fourth point that's not on the screens, but I'll just say, he gives this clarification in verse 20. And the clarification that he, he gives is an interesting one. He's really speaking to his audience at the time. But the clarification that Paul gives in this, he says, the law was added so that trespass might increase. The law was added so that trespass might increase. What is Paul saying here? Why is he saying this? Well, he's speaking very specifically to his audience at the time, uh, partly of whom were Jewish uh, people, the people of uh, Israel in that time, who many of whom would have thought there are not two definitive eons in the world, but three to talk about that there is the eon of Moses and of the law. Now, each of us feel this as well in a sense that that, 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 you, that, that there, is, there is the law of God that we are aware of in the world. We, we've heard the way that God would have us live. And, 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 and Paul is saying to the Jewish people here, and I think to us as well, that we need to understand that the law was added so that trespass might increase. That sounds very strange and dark, isn't it? The law was not added. We are not aware of what God requires of us, of, of people, um, so that we can, in a way, live up to the law and receive the merits and goodness of God through our own uh, work. And, and readers at the time would have easily taken that into uh, consideration. They would have said that the law, or following the law of Moses, we know them, all the thou shells from Exodus that give the beautiful life, the fruitful life, that following the law, they would say, actually increases my righteousness. That's what would be said. And Paul here, though, is going more. He's saying, look, there is an understanding of the law here that you need to get, understanding of Christ's work that you need to get, that the role of the law in kind of the eons of salvation in the, in the world, salvation history, is a negative role of the law. The law does not re relieve Adam's condition. The law doesn't we don't use the law as a ladder to climb ourselves out of the eon that Adam institutes through his disobedience. But in fact, the law makes all that worse. Right? As we, as, we, as we read God's word and see the ways that God calls us to live, the law is not concerned with preventing my sin. The law is not concerned with giving me salvation. Uh, as I, read, as I read the law of God from beginning to end in the Bible and the way it is that God calls us to live, what, what we've realized, as the, the, the rich young ruler does in the Gospels, that the law can only condemn. The law can only show me how, how, how much I am a child of Adam. Uh, the law cannot redeem me. I know this is heavy, so thank you for staying with me. These are after this, where the, the heavy lifting I think is almost finished. But if you go to Romans chapter 3 and verse 19, we see Paul's argumentation here. He says, Romans 3 19, he says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law, rather through the law we become conscious of sin. And St. Augustine, uh, that famous theologian from Africa in the fourth century, he says, for the law was not given to make sinners alive. It is divine grace alone by, which, by faith which makes us alive, he says, but to show with what strong chains of sin those are bound and held captive who arrogantly assert that the law is to be kept by their own power. 
And I think we can easily confuse in our time and day Christianity, biblical Christianity, with this whole concept that Paul is giving, that we can so easily confuse them that we must, in a way, do something better or be more right in our thinking or words or, or be more perfect in order to gain the love or acceptance of God. And, and Paul comes at the end of this chapter to the very heart of the Christian gospel, the very heart of the Christian message, the very heart, I think, of the, of the key understanding of what it means to have abundant life in Christ, which is that none of us have any power, that we come to God in a way, not with all of the good things that we've piled up in our lives, but we come to God, each one of us, with open hands that are completely empty. And we come, as Paul says in the next set of verses to end chapter 5, we come to receive his grace. So two final eons to understand. And finally, Paul ends chapter 5 with one final word to be heard. One final word to be heard. And what is that word? It's that grace reigns through Christ. He says, but where sin increased, that is the struggle we have with doing what's right, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more, and grace reigns. Do we know that grace, the grace of God in Jesus Christ, reigns? What is the grace of God? Well, one definition of the grace of God is the free, I'm not sure I have it up there, the free universal operation of God's person and presence that initiate the spiritual life of God's people. What is the grace of God? The grace of God is the power of of God, by which we, on a, on a daily level and even an eternal level, are nourished, are restored, uh, in a sense, his redemption, uh, and go through our lives knowing. Uh, Paul talks about the grace of God in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and 9, that your grace, O God, is sufficient for me. There's a power in God's grace. Romans chapter 1, Paul gives like the heaviest set of chapters maybe in the whole New Testament, uh, in, Romans, in, in Romans 1 all the way to the middle of Romans. But Romans 1 and verse 7, what does he say to the people in Rome? Grace and peace to you. Paul repeats that all through his letters. All the letters, Ephesus, all these churches he writes to. What's one of the first things he says to them? And one of the last in some letters. Grace to you. Paul wants Christians to understand something. He wants them to understand that, that just as sin abounds, and we know that well, grace superabounds. <laughs> grace increases, he says, all the more. It's a word that he kind of makes up in Greek, in fact, um, that grace superabounds. He only uses it twice here and elsewhere in 2 Corinthians. Paul, Paul doesn't minimize sin in any kind of way, but he, but he does not lose an opportunity to stress the victory of God's grace, that, that grace is so much more than evil. And that's one of the dangers we have in talking about these two great aeons in, in history and how the world is set up. We can so easily have our eyes turned way too much towards the air of sin and death because we, we see it so often around us. But Paul wants us to turn our eyes all the more to this grace which increases all the more. And he uses that language not only in this verse, but if you have your Bibles, you can put your finger up to verse 15. He talks about the gift as well and the gift of God. He says, how much more did God's grace, how much more? And in verse 17 again, you can put your finger on verse 17. 
For if the trespass of one man death reigned, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace? And then here in verse 21, grace increased all the more. Yes, Paul is saying sin, sin does reign at times. On Thursday night when Jesus was in the garden, praying for that cup to pass before him, sin reigned. Thursday night when he was taken from one place to the other, Caiaphas and Pilate, when he was mocked and called names and beaten and dragged around, sin, sin reigned. When he was put on that cross for us in the shame and in the disgrace and in the pain, when nails were put through his hands for our salvation, sin It's why the rocks split apart. It's why the dead (laughs) were raised. Creation felt some wrong kind of shiver go go, go through it and the death of Jesus on the cross. But we we know from Scripture and we know from that story in Scripture that even though sin reigned in that darkness, grace reigned all the more. That Jesus doesn't stay bound by sin on the cross and by his work on the cross, but, but grace reigns, that God raises his, him from the dead. That he, he steps out of the tomb and is sitting at the right hand of God the Father. And Paul does not want us to lose sight of this truth. I said last week, maybe one way to think about it is the measuring sticks in your basement. We've moved houses a couple times, so we have lost our measuring sticks of kids growing up, different things or whatever. And, and you might, but our, my parents have one in their basement, and you can see how, how small sometimes people are way down here. Some small ones at Blessings all the time, which is wonderful. And you can see other tick marks up, up there that are, that are way higher. And Paul wants us to understand the reign of God's grace the reign of God's grace through Jesus Christ as the sum, as the center of what it means to have abundant life in Christ. John Stott, I want to read a really long quote for you. Uh, John Stott says it in these words, For grace forgives sins through the cross and bestows on the sinner both righteousness and eternal life. Grace satisfies the thirsty soul and fills the hungry with good things. Grace sanctifies sinners, shaping them into the image of Christ. Grace preserves even with the uh, recalcitrant, determining to complete what he has begun. And one day grace will destroy death and consummate the kingdom. So when we're convinced that grace, so so when we are convinced that grace reigns, we will remember that God's throne is a throne of grace And we will come to it boldly to receive mercy and to find grace in our time of need. Well, as we bring this chapter to a close and today's sermon to a close, um, how can we just apply this to our hearts and how can we think about this a bit more? Well, I guess one way to consider it is this, is This morning, do you find yourself abounding in sin, or do you find yourselves abounding in Christ? How do you know if you're abounding in sin? Well, it's a hard thing sometimes to do. Uh, We can look look to, of course, what God's Word says, and if we're living differently to that, that's something for us to change. Is Is there bitterness in my heart because of something? Am I concealing something in my heart? Is there spitefulness in my heart or in my words? Uh, is, there, is there a sin that I need to take in this moment in my life that I've nurtured and held on to and been ashamed of because I'm going to fix it myself or I don't deserve to receive assurance and love because of all the, the bad that I've done? Is there a sin in my life that I need to offer to the grace of God? And I guess part of the abundant life in Christ is, by the work of the Spirit, having the trust, uh, having the, the sense of vulnerability to, to open our hearts to people we love, to open our hearts to God. 
And we know from the Bible that when we do confess our sins, God is faithful and just. He is kind. He is kind. He wants to forgive us. He wants us to know his goodness overflowing in our hearts. But I want to reemphasize as we close how much greater the reign of Jesus is than the reign of death. The reign of Jesus is not only equivalent or like the reign of Adam, but it is so much better. There is extravagance, there is quantity in the grace of Christ and his gift to us. Calvin says Christ is much more powerful to save than Adam is to destroy. (laughs) Isn't that beautiful? That as we think about the work of Christ and and, and look to him and, and surrender to him, we sit in even a better place than Eden. Uh, We sit in the palace of God, in the courtroom of God, at the throne of God through the work of Christ. His work is better and greater. That that the work of Christ, the work of Adam has alienated us from God, but the work of Christ has brought us closer to God than, than any have ever known. That Jesus is in fact God with us. The work of Jesus is, is even greater than the sickness that Adam brought. The, the heights that Christ brings us to through his work on the cross is much, much, much higher than how far we fell down in Genesis 2 and 3. The fall was like this, but the heights that Christ elevates us to are so much higher. Put it this way. Somebody said this. I didn't say hear who, but somebody did say this. There's more grace in Jesus Christ than sin in us. Grace is greater than all of the sin that I might be holding on to or living in. And so many people before us have gotten this in their own spiritual lives, in their own journeys. Many people in the Bible have gotten this, understood it, it hit them. One very famous guy was John Bunyan. (laughs) Looking for some reading this week, you can read that book. Um, what's the subtitle of his book? Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners, Pilgrim's Progress. There's a quote in there. It says, there's a guy living in that book, Pilgrim's Progress. He says, now my name is Christian, but what my name used to be is graceless. Friends, do you grasp this morning that Jesus towers over Adam, that he offers us Life like Adam never can or will. So what is your vision? What is your vision for the world? What is your vision for your own life? What is your vision for your family? What is the vision for the vocation that God has put you in this world? What is your view this morning of ultimate reality? Are you living really, truly in an Old Testament kind of view where sin and death is actually mostly it? Or are you living truly as if Christ has come? Do you find you're living mostly where guilt reigns and uncertainty and fear? Or do you find you're living in a place where Jesus is king over all the universe, over even death itself? The truth of this chapter and the truth of the book of Romans, and the truth of the gospel, which has eternal weight, is that the reign of Satan, the one who comes to accuse us, to destroy, the reign of Satan is an illusion. It's a bluff. The reign of evil uh, is temporary. And when we look to the cross, we see the reign of Jesus, decisively. Colossians 2 and verse 15, And having disarmed the powers and the authorities, Jesus made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them on the cross. Jesus reigns. He reigns. He's in still in his body. He reigns in the courts of heaven at the right hand of God the Father, welcoming the nations 
to come to him. How will you have abundant life in Christ? How will you consider this? Well, remember the last words of this chapter that Paul gives, that it's through our Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe this series has got a hold of you in some ways. Maybe there are parts of your life where I don't sense the abundance of God. I don't sense that at all, Pastor Greg. I, I, I sense fear. I sense worry. I sense temporality. Well, if you're interested in any kind of abundant life, I want you to know that grace in Jesus reigns over even the parts of your life that you think grace cannot reign. That grace reigns even over the parts of our lives and world that we think God is unable to touch. Christ has taken the eon of Adam and has sent it away forever. So if you're looking for abundant life, first cling to Jesus. Allow the Holy Spirit to have your hearts and minds turned to him. And then spend time this week in prayer, simply adoring Jesus. Adore him. Pray in the name of Jesus. Mention his grace. Mention his goodness. And allow it to sink right deeply into your soul. Will you turn to him afresh this morning? And will you let your life and the calling God has on you, will you let your own life become a parable of God's grace? Let's pray. Well, Lord, we do want our lives to be a parable of your grace. We do want to be found in him whose mercy and grace reigns and is without end. So forgive us for belittling Christ, for not trusting him. Forgive us for loving the ways of Adam. And Lord, grant a new compassion, a new power, a new strength in every heart that is here this morning. In the call and love and mercy of our crucified and risen Savior for each of us, we pray this in his glorious name. Amen.
we'll just, as we do every Sunday morning, have a short time of prayer for our congregation and for our world. Uh, Let's bow down. Let's pray together. Well, gracious God, you are eternal and good and holy and perfect in everything you do. We thank you and praise you this morning and worship you for who you are, the God eternal, the one who has sent his son to redeem us and your spirit to sustain us, to open your word to us, to convict us of sin, to remind us of who we are in Christ. Gracious God, as we come to prayer this morning, it's impossible to not remember before you in the midst of your people all of the things we see that are happening in Israel and in Gaza. And gracious God, our hearts are broken for all the things we see. Lord, our hearts are broken for the anti-Semitism and words of hate that we see spoken around the world for the Jewish people. Our hearts are broken, particularly, Lord, as Christians, because they are the ones to whom you first gave your promises and made your covenants, the ones to whom you said, you will be my people and I will be your God. And we thank you, Lord, that we also are heirs of this promise through Jesus. And so, Lord, it's hard for us to even know how to pray in a situation like this. We know that you are sovereign and eternal. We do want to pray for the people of Israel at this time, for your help and strength, Lord, upon them. At the same time, Lord, we also pray as Christians that the vulnerable people of Gaza, children and people without defenses, may not be made to pay for the sins of Hamas. And Lord, we know that you never finish your work in this world, that you remain sovereign over all people and hearts and rulers. And we do invoke your sovereignty and help and peace and security at this time. And we ask and lift this whole difficult situation up to you in the strong name of Jesus and pray for his speedy return. And gracious God, we also do pray for the needs in our own congregation Having looked uh, to the world around us, we pray uh, for uh, Carrie and Jay's father who's received a very difficult um, health diagnosis of cancer, and we pray for your grace to attend him, Father, and that whole family. We pray for Peter who's uh, getting a checkup on his new lungs this week, and we pray for your grace in that surgery. And we pray for Nancy, that you continue to heal her from her serious accident. Lord, we finally do pray for ourselves. We thank you that you love us, that you want the best for us. We thank you so very much, Lord, that you've called us to be within this church, blessing this Christian church, this place you've provided to worship. What a joy it is, Lord, to desire to outdo one another in showing honor, to love each other with zeal. And we ask your blessing upon all the small groups that are now meeting in earnest and different programs and communities and teaching for different ages. And we pray that you would bless the leaders of these small groups, that there would be wonderful and multiple communities of Christ meeting throughout the week to pray and care for each other, that we may be uplifted as you call us a journey together in the ways that Christ is today. And we ask that you go before us, Lord. We thank you that you go before us, that we have nothing to fear, that you you know all things in this week ahead, even before they begin. And so we put our trust in you. We offer you our thanks. Be pleased with us, Lord, in all that we do. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
Well, pastors like talking about money in church just about as going, just like they want to go to the dentist. But um, I, I do want to say two things about finances. The first thing is our offering is regular this morning. Um, and if you are a guest here or first, second, you have no obligation to participate in this. Uh, the offering this morning is going to a special cause. This goes to the deacons. And they are, at this month, uh, the cause is going towards, uh, it is still going towards the Christian Counseling Center in Burlington. And so you can give to that through deacons at blessingshamilton.ca. You can also give uh, in the monthly boxes at the back of the church uh, physically if you wish to give that way. Also, just in this time of the year, you may have seen the email that went out this week. If you are a member of the congregation, if this is your family, um, again, not speaking to you if this is your first or second time, but if you are part of Blessings as a member, you may have seen a financial update go out uh, through the email. If not, take a minute and read it. just want to encourage us as we consider that for the rest of the year from 2 Corinthians chapter. 8 and 9, uh, about principles for biblical giving. We read in there four principles, that giving is an expression of the grace of God. It says, the grace of God, the grace God has given to the Macedonian churches. Secondly, we see in 2 Corinthians 8, Christian giving is inspired by the cross of Christ. Paul writes, you know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, who for our sakes became poor. And thirdly, we see that Christian giving is proportionate giving in 2 Corinthians 8. Paul says, we give according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Isn't that a beautiful clarification? And fourthly, not only is giving an expression of the grace of God in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, inspired by the cross of Jesus, proportionate to what we have, but also Christian giving, Paul teaches us, resembles a harvest. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever gives generously will also reap generously. Not to say this is a prosperity gospel, <laughs> no. But it's about a settled conviction about how much we will give to the work of Christ in a local church. Um, and so um, that's Second Corinthians 9 and verse 6. And so as we have a moment of reflection, I ask you to prayerfully consider uh, all of those things. I'll invite you as you're able to rise for our uh, blessing today. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. Amen.
Thank you so much for worshiping with us this morning. Uh, we hope to see you this evening. Uh, and as a reminder, if you can take the exit at the back of the church or the front of the church, that would be very appreciated.